Hello, welcome back. I'm Sean from Bacon and Games, and this is the third video in our Snake Code Along series. If you're just joining us, there are links to the previous videos in the comments below. We left off last time with a functional player controller and a system for wrapping the player from one side of the screen to the other. In today's video, we're going to add a spawner class that randomly generates food, and then we'll build our tail class so that the snake can get longer when it eats. Let's create the tail scene by going to Scene, New scene. We'll select other node because you'll recall in the first video we wanted this to inherit from snake part. Because snake part is an area 2D, we're getting this warning that it needs a collision shape. And the collision shape, you'll recall, requires a shape. We're also going to need a sprite 2D. And for now, let's just drag in our apple and move that back up so we can see our collision shape. Let's rename it tail and save it in our gameplay folder. Because this inherits from snake part, it already has our snake part script attached to it. Later, we're going to want to add a little bit of code to customize the tail. So rather than using this script directly, we're gonna right click on our tail and select extend script. We're gonna leave it defaulted to tail and give it a class name tail. For right now, we don't need any additional code to make our tail work, but later we will come back to the tail class and add some code that only the tail needs. We can delete this default code and save. Now let's go through a similar process to create our food. Scene, new scene. Our food can inherit directly from area 2D because we're only looking to detect collisions between the snake and the food. We don't need anything else special. Because we're in area 2D, we're gonna add our collision shape and our circle like we've done before. And we're also going to add our sprite and drag in our star graphic, which you can see here. We're gonna rename this to food and save. Our food class actually doesn't need any code, so we're not gonna add a script. But now that we have our food and our tail scene set up, we can go back to our gameplay and start working on our spawner. Go to gameplay. Let's add a new node 2D, call it spawner, and attach a script called spawner. Our spawner class is going to be responsible for dropping food at a random location inside of our game field. Let's start by creating a function called spawn food that we'll call each time the snake eats the piece of food that's already in our game scene. Though this spawner class is very simple, it's going to make use of a couple of very common Godot design patterns. Signals, export variables, and instantiating packed scenes. When spawning a piece of food, we need a few elements. Where to spawn it, or its starting position. What we're spawning, this is instantiation and where we're going to put it, or who is the parent object of what we've spawned. We can start by creating a vector two that will hold our spawn point. Since we need the food to appear somewhere within our gameplay field, we'll need to know the bounds of our screen, which you'll remember we've already created for the wrapping. We can create a reference to our bounds node and reuse that existing code. That's gonna be our export variable. We can type at export, var bounds and give it a type bounds. Now if I click on our spawner and look at our properties window, we can see that export variable bounds here. If I click this assign button, it'll bring up a window allowing me to select the bounds object that I want to reference. Now within our spawner class, we have access to our bounds object. We'll set it to vector2.0 to start, but we're going to end up setting each x and y position separately in a moment. We'll start by picking a random x value for our spawn point somewhere between the x minimum and x maximum from our bounds class. We can use a built-in function called randfrange, which will return a random float between two floats. In this case, bounds.xmin and bounds.xmax. To make sure our food never spawns directly on the edge of the game screen, let's, let's add our global grid size to the minimum value and subtract it from the maximum. 
This will make sure that the food never spawns any closer than 32 pixels from the edge of our screen. Let's copy this line and duplicate it below. Now I can hold the Option key and insert multiple cursors, hit the Delete key, enter Y in all three places at once. Now we have our Y component with the same constraints. Now that we have the location we're going to spawn the food at, we need a way to access the thing that we want to spawn. That's our instantiating pack scenes. So we're going to create a variable called food underscore scene of typed packed scene. And we're going to set that to our food scene, which we can drag in. And if we hold control and let go, we're going to get the path to our food scene wrapped in this preload function. This will preload our food seed into memory so that when we go to instantiate it, it's immediately available. Now let's instantiate our food. Instantiating the food creates it, but doesn't add it to our scene tree. That's what we're going to do in this next step. We're going to get a reference to our parent. In this case, the parent of our spawner is our gameplay scene. We're going to call getParent.AddChild and pass in food. Get parent in this case will return a reference to our gameplay node because spawner is a direct child of gameplay. In a simple game like ours, using get parent is fairly safe because we know that our scene tree isn't going to change very much throughout the course of development. However, in a more complicated project, down the line we may end up moving spawner somewhere else in the scene tree, which would change its parent. For example, if I drag spawner into our bounds node, bounds is now the parent, and this code would mean that we would be adding our food to the bounds node, which is not what we want. I'm going to undo that. But like I said, because this is a fairly simple project, we can get away with this. Before we can test this, we need to set the position of our food to our spawn point. Now we can return to our gameplay script. Let's grab a reference by clicking and dragging. Remember to control click before you release. Let's force it to spawner as spawner to make sure that we get our code completion. And in our onReady function, we can tell our spawner to spawn food. So when we test the game, you see we get our first bit of food. Granted, when we run into it, nothing happens because we haven't written that part yet. And also, and this is the thing I wanted to show you, you'll notice that it's not nicely fit to this grid the way we would want, but that's an easy fix. Let's go back to our spawner class. Before we make this assignment, let's round down whatever random number is stored in our X and Y values so that it fits on our 32 by 32 grid. We can use this built-in floor F function that will take a float and round it down to the nearest integer. So we'll take our spawn point, divide it by our grid size. This will give us an integer representing the column that the random X value has fallen in. To convert it back into our grid size, we can just multiply it by global dot grid size. And again, we can copy and paste and then convert this to Y. If we run our game, now the food will always fall nicely in our 32 by 32 grid. Next, let's work on detecting when the head of the snake has collided with one of the food bits. We'll start by going to over to our food we're going to add it to a group called food, which we can do by selecting the root node, coming over to node inspector tab, select group. We're going to type food and add. This means that every piece of food we generate will belong to this food group. Groups tend to be a little bit inefficient, so I try to use them sparingly, but for a game of this size, this is going to work perfectly fine. Now with that added, let's come over to our head class. We're going to click on head and then next to where we had group selected, we're going to come over here to signals. Since both the head and the food inherit from area 2D, we can make use of this area entered signal. If I double click, it's going to allow me to connect this on area entered signal to my head class. Right now, this won't do anything, but if we come in here and type print collided with area dot name and run our game. See when the head collides with the food, we get collided with food. Great. So our collisions work. Now let's wire them up to do something meaningful. 
First thing I'd like to do is differentiate between running into food and anything else. In the game Snake, the head can either collide with a piece of food or its own tail. In the case of the food, we want to remove that food and spawn another. In the case of the tail, we've crashed into ourselves, and the game ends. So we're gonna run a check against this area, which is the area of the thing we've collided to. And we're gonna say if area dot is in group food, we've collided with food or even food. Else we've collided with something that isn't food. In our case, that's going to be the tail because there's only two things that we can collide with. Normally, to remove a node from the scene tree, we can call QFree on it. So in this case, we can type area.QFree when that collision happens, which will work, but there's a better way to do this. You'll see if I run into this, it does remove it, but since we're removing a physics object, it's generally safer to defer this call until after that physics frame completes and before the next one starts. So instead of calling area.qfree, we're gonna call area.calldeferred and we're gonna pass in the name of the function that we wanna call. This is gonna cue that to be freed up at the end of the physics cycle rather than in the middle of it, which can cause unexpected issues. But we can't just delete the food from the game. We need to be able to tell the gameplay scene that a piece of food has been eaten. This will allow us to cover that third common design pattern, signals. Let's define a signal called food eaten that we will use to report to gameplay when we've eaten a piece of food. To do so, we can call food underscore eaten dot emit right before we delete this to let the rest of the game know that a piece of food has been eaten. Of course, emitting this signal won't do anything unless we tell what things to listen for that signal. So let's go back into our gameplay and connect the food eaten signal to a function that lives in our gameplay class. We can do that by calling head.foodeaten.connect and then we're gonna pass in a function that we're gonna create now, on food eaten. We're gonna get this angry warning because the on food eaten function doesn't exist, but we're gonna create it right down here. Let's add a print statement in here for a quick test. Food eaten. If I run the game and we eat our food, you can see we get the food eaten message suggesting that we dropped into our on food eaten function but of course nothing has happened because we haven't put any game logic in there yet. We're making progress. There are four things that we're gonna do every time a piece of food is eaten. For starters, let's make sure that every time we eat a piece of food, we spawn more food so that we can keep playing. So we can call spawner.spawnfood. If I run this, when we eat food, we get more food, but you'll notice we're getting errors. And that's because we're trying to add a physics object while we're in the middle of a physics loop. We can fix that the same way we fixed the queue free by calling spawner dot call deferred spawn food. And that's gonna wait until this physics tick ends, then it'll add it before a new one begins. If we run and collect food, you'll see we're no longer getting that error. Great. Starting to feel like an actual game now. I'd like to try to keep these under 20 minutes, so I think we're gonna call this one here. In the next video, we'll work on adding tail pieces each time the player eats some food. I know your time is valuable, and I really appreciate you spending it with me. Please like and subscribe so I can reach more makers like yourself. Until next time, be kind to yourself and be kind to others. Bye-bye.